Hello, Andrew here. Welcome to lecture six in the Using Creative Multimedia for Youth Engagement module. This lecture will be on development discourse in digital multimedia. Now, um, just much like the other lectures we've had, the, the previous ones, this can only be considered a snapshot of a really vast subject and kind of ever evolving one about like, you know, as far as kind of the the theoretical philosophical base of what development actually is and you know what that can entail or should entail both historically and present and towards the future which we, we get at especially in relation to um you know more global environmental impacts and a more globalized sort of economic situation how that has constantly kind of evolved and um, what we do really is we're just going to have a snapshot of that and a few kind of media examples of how we can see how this kind of plays out or um, the different sort of perceptions that can kind of arise from this really as what is considered good and productive and indeed development. So to that end, we're going to just use this more generic theory of development theory being a collection of theories about how desirable change in society is best achieved. Such theories draw on a variety of social science disciplines and approaches. So it's as broad as that, really. We just have this umbrella term under which to hang everything. And then we look at, like, you know, in terms of those, um, you know, the, the various and very particular sort of theories in any one direction at any particular time, we have this sort of snapshot of a, a few in which we'll, we'll just kind of, I again, I'm just going to kind of... um give put that in the in the air really that there are these theories and then some of them will kind of apply like neoclassical theory and um, sustainable development uh, post development theory and post structural theory in in regards where we're at currently and towards the you know into the future and also with a view on you know bringing it right back to you know the rights of young people and you know the you know um fostering uh you know a safe and you know um, productive environment and you know somewhere yeah just a, a world for young people really where, where you work heads on where we'd want to kind of educate to that end so we kind of cover a few of, of those ends with it um so i'm just going to give a quick little breakdown of this just so we can see where we're coming from um and then as i said if we if needs be true we can kind of reference them again so we look at the modern modernization theory um, it being used in a broader sense to analyze processes in which modernization in societies take place. Um, you know, so that can look at aspects of the country. It looks at the various aspects of countries um, uh, um, what constitutes obstacles in those countries really and what's beneficial or an obstacle towards an economic development. So that, you know, in the broadest kind of sp uh, scope, that's what we're talking about. A structuralism being a development theory focusing on the structural aspects that impede economic growth of developing countries mostly um, and the unit of you know and this is kind of what what's quantifying opposite what being a vital part here and it's just uh, the unit of analysis in the is the transformation of a country's economy from subsistence say agricultural economy uh, to a modern urbanized manufacturing service economy so that being the shift that would measure a you know where you could measure a, a, a growth or a development really with that depends dependency theory then being notion of the resources flown from a periphery of poor and underdeveloped states to a core uh, the center of wealthy states and enriching the latter at the expense of the former um it's you know and that's kind of um it, it, the main contention here being that poor states are impoverished and rich ones enriched by the way poor states are integrated into a world system so we'd start talking about this world system um throughout now especially in relation to neoclassical theory which is kind of the the rigor at the moment and um you know it's hard to kind of have a, conf a conversation or you know a discussion about global sort of globalization or global development without neoclassical theory being central to that sadly because it's kind of it is the um the defining one and it's going to feature quite heavily in this lecture um and that being a, a, a theory that basically the the, the the gist of this is that um consumers goal is you know to maximize utilities and a customer and and the customer satisfaction really and an organization's goal is to maximize profit so this argues that the customer is ultimately in control of that situation in control of the 
of the market forces such as price etc um, this is highly contentious and highly de very much you know debatable if that is even the case and again we'll have some kind of firm examples of that where we see there's a constant sort of shifting sand around that and different sort of mediate perceptions of of how that might actually be or what what you know we, we if you have this constant sort of shift and change in value well then where does the customer stand in relation to that i suppose would be um one key element which we'll see now especially when we talk about banking systems um and then we look at like sustainable development again being sort of you know a, a kickback really from this sort of failing neoclassical model which would just be um you know, look mostly in relation to um, environmental impacts on, on on the earth. Really, what you know, what constitutes a future and future generations which have been abandoned by the sort of baby, baby boomer, neoclassical sort of uh, generation with it. And this development means the um, needs of the pre meeting the needs of the present without compromising future generations to meet their own needs. So again, you know, sort of. Uh, issues of environment, sustainability, conservation are all kind of vitally important to a sustainable development theory and practice. And then we look at the posts, really, where we have post-development theory and post-structuralism. Um, post-development theory holds um, that the whole concept and, and practice of development and even, like, you know, the kind of the critical discourse of the word, the, you know, a semantic breakdown of the word development is a reflection of western northern hegemony over the rest of the world so you know this being sort of some extension of colonialism or neo-colonialism or just in you know the um you know just new clothes emperor and new clothes essentially um and that would be like a you know a kind of key point there and post-structuralism just kind of rejecting the rigidity that comes with um you know single meanings and purposes because we're talking about very very abstract things and very sort of nebulous um ideas and ways of living and different inter interchanges between people and things and you know economics and there's a whole lot of things going on there so just shifting from the rigidity of those words and terminologies doing it um it, it, you know instead given every individual reader or you know it, it, everything kind of individualized in a purpose and a meaning existence in a specific in, in a specific i suppose we can leave it as, as broad as that really so um yeah, as I said, I don't want to kind of, there's a lot of information to get through here, but I don't want to bamboozle where basically that's kind of a snapshot of different areas of the same thing. Most of this would have come about from, you know, post Second World War when, you know, development and rebuilding post war became a it became a, an issue in, in Europe in particular. And then, you know, it was kind of extended out into, you know, third world environments and uh, third world countries. And this kind of notional idea of, you know, it, it, it being for the greater good and this sort of extension of capitalism and capital being of the great towards a greater good where everyone can have the same sort of um, rights or freedoms and kind of purchasing power simultaneously. And that's sort of where this all kind of begins to fall apart, I suppose. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show quite a long video, but it's really, really interesting. Um, it's going to be about 10 minutes, 11 minutes long. And it's basically a snapshot of the whole of the history of economics, where you, even these sorts of terms and everything will be expanded from it. All I can say is it's really well put together. Um, and it's, it's kind of unique that we have these technologies, including the internet and kind of YouTube that can disseminate this sort of information and kind of take a lot of the, the myth away from it. And, you know, that sort of obscurity, which makes it look like it's, um, really really complicated stuff and just kind of breaking that down into si really simplified things that can be understood so just bear with this really um watch it it's just basically a snapshot of economics um explaining sort of very simple terms and well illustrated and then we'll come back after that and uh, discuss further okay actually apologies i've got it the wrong way around so i'm gonna yeah here we are I try my best to dispel this widespread perception that economics is too complicated for non-economists. And actually it's very strange because people have very strong opinions about everything. Iraq war, gay marriage, does God exist, you know, global warming. You all have very strong views on these things, 
despite not having a degree in theology, not having a degree in energy economics, not having a degree in international relations. But when it comes to economics, people say, oh, yeah, it's for specialists, you know, I don't know. But why? I mean, if you can have a very strong view on Iraq or Afghanistan without a degree in international relations, you should have a that strong view on government economic policy without a degree in economics. You know, I say that this is only because uh, the economists have been fantastically successful in making people believe that it is actually a lot more difficult than what it really is. So they'll tell you, oh, you know, I could explain it to you, but then you don't understand. 95% yeah? of economics is common sense. Of course, made to look difficult with the use of jargon and mathematics. Huh? And even the remaining 5% can be understood at least uh, in its essence, if not in all technical details, uh, if uh, someone bothers to explain it to you in an accessible way. For example, what is economics? You know? The ethical foundations of economics. Whether you can separate economics and politics. And how different ways of conceptualizing the economy affects the way we see the world. You know, For example, people think that today's free market economics is a direct descendant of uh, Adam Smith. But this is not true. You know, in Adam Smith and other so-called classical economists, the society, the economy was conceptualized as being made up of classes, you know, not individuals. You know? And the whole theory evolved around how the way these different classes with different material interests behave affect the way capital is accumulated, the economy grows, income is distributed, and so on. Today, in free market economics, there's only individuals. You know? When you uh, tell people, oh, the, you know, isn't there a class? They say, no, I mean, that, that's an old Marxist concept. But if that's the case, why do the marketing companies have all these uh, class categories when they do <coughs> marketing campaign strategy? Yeah? Because they uh, look at yeah, groups A, B, C, C1, C2, yeah? target the advertising according to the type of people. Now, many economists will tell you that economics is a science in which there's only one right theory. There are at least nine different major schools of economics, and in these several more, if you count minor schools or split the major ones into sub-schools, each with its own unique strengths and weaknesses. And for free market economics alone, you have three different kinds. Classical economics, neoclassical economics, Austrian economics. So actually, there isn't one right theory. And my contention is that we need all these diverse approaches to economics in order to fully understand our economy, because they all make certain assumptions. They all have different underlying political and ethical values. They have all the sorts of different theories about how the economy grows and so on. And to make this point, I give you the Singapore problem, or what I call life is uh, stranger than fiction. Huh? You know, if you read only the financial newspapers like the Wall Street Journal or the Economist magazine, you'll be only told that Singapore succeeded because of uh, its uh, free trade policy and its welcoming attitude towards uh, foreign investors. This is partly true. I mean, they did have those things, but you will never be told that Singapore government owns nearly 90% of all the land. 85% of housing is provided by government-owned housing corporation, and a staggering 22% of GDP is produced by state-owned enterprises. So in talking about Singapore, I always uh, tell my students, look, give me one economic theory. It doesn't matter what it is, neoclassical, Marxist, Austrian, Schumpeterian. Give me one economic theory that can explain Singapore. Well, there isn't. So you need to know these uh, different theories to fully understand how a country like uh, Singapore could succeed. So in this regard, my advice is that you should not be a man or a woman with a hammer by learning only one kind of economic theory. Because whatever that uh, theory is, uh, once you believe that one theory is true, like the man with the hammer, you will start to see everything as a name. So I say that you should get a Swiss knife. Yeah? In this dominant economic theory that is uh, of today, that is uh, neoclassical theory, People are mainly conceptualized as consumers. And work is uh, considered as what uh, these economists call disutility that you have to put up with so that you can earn money with which you consume goods and services and then derive pleasure or what they call utility. That's your aim, deriving pleasure from consumption. 
But what happens in our workplace uh, fundamentally affects us, not just our immediate physical and psychological well-being, but also our identity and our sense of self-worth and our self-fulfillment. This is why these days in many rich countries, a lot of people are very unhappy compared to, say, a couple of decades ago, despite the fact that they have higher income. Why? Because uh, the work has uh, become more stressful. But then, you know, economists tell you, no, you should be happy. You know, Britain today has a uh, 20% higher income than, uh, say, 1975. Yeah? Why aren't you happy? Yeah? You know, my book is uh, not just an explanation of economic theories and facts. It's also a discussion about the role of economics in public life. And in this regard, I have three sets of observations to make. The first one is never trust an economist, and that includes me. Yeah? You know, professional economists that are like to say, oh, you, we know what is correct. You know? No, they don't have a monopoly over truth. I already told you that there are nine different kinds of economic theory. So the right the conclusion depends on which economist you talk to. Yeah? And I argue that it is entirely possible for people who are not professional economists uh, to have sound judgments on economic issues. I even argue that sometimes their judgments may even be better than those of professional economists because they may be more rooted in reality and less narrowly focused. And I argue that indeed the willingness on the part of the ordinary citizens uh, to challenge professional economists and other experts is a foundation of democracy. You know, if you really believe that all we have to do is to listen to the experts, to listen to the professional consensus of the experts, why do you need democracy? Yeah, uh, let self-elected elites that, uh, appoint each other and run the world. You know, this is why a lot of people are unhappy with the European Union. You know? The second point is the Latin phrase uh, that is apparently written on the walls of the city hall of uh, Gouda, the city in the Netherlands, uh, which is famous for the cheese. And it says, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to uh, pretend to speak Latin. So it uh, basically says, listen even to the other side. And I argue that this is the attitude you have, have to have in debating on economic issues. I'm not suggesting that you should have no opinion of your own. But what I'm uh, trying to tell you is that given the complexity of the world and given the necessarily partial nature of all economic theories, you should be humble about the validity of your own favorite theory and should keep an open mind about it. Finally, uh, even while I constantly make reform proposals, I emphasize how difficult it is to change the economic reality. Well, sometimes uh, the reason is uh, obvious. I mean, people who benefit from the status quo want to thwart the uh, change by any means, you know, lobbying, bribery, media propaganda, and even violence. But the status quo often gets defended even without some people actively being evil. Because uh, the thing about the market system is that the rule is one dollar, one vote. You know? So this means that the ability of those with less money to refuse undesirable options given to them is highly constrained. Also, we can be susceptible to beliefs that are against our own interests. You know, the best uh, the, the example is that what happened when Barack Obama tried to reform the American medical insurance system, and there were all these pictures of uh, old pensioners demonstrating against uh, what they call Obamacare with placards that uh, saying things like, government hands off my Medicare. Well, except that Medicare is a government program. Yeah? <laughs> well, this is what the Marxists uh, used to call false consciousness, or also known as uh, the Matrix, yeah? the movie. Yeah? But acknowledging the difficulties involved in changing the economic status quo should not make us give up the fight to create a better economy and better society. Yes, changes are difficult, but in the long run, if uh, enough people fight for something hard enough, many impossible things can happen. Yeah? And I don't forget, I mean, 200 years ago, if you suggested that America should abolish slavery, you would have been branded at least uh, unrealistic yeah? and that uh, probably the uh, loony. Yeah? 100 years ago, the, the, the British government put women in prison for asking for vote. 
A lot of women actually said, why do we need votes? We have our husbands and brothers to represent our views. Well, this is why I quote Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, uh, who once said that we need to have pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. Yeah, you have to accept the difficulties of changing the status quo, but you have to believe that this can be done. And finally, as uh, Nelson Mandela used to say, it always seems impossible until it is done. Okay, so a really interesting um, snapshot of economics there. Um, and just, you know, kind of drawn attention to a lot of different sides of this sort of, you know, um, essentially a pseudoscience presented as a, you know something exacting and i suppose over overall that is sort of the broader you know discourse of like a mediated discourse around economics in particular is that it's some sort of perfect science um and that you know it, it, it's this rigid thing that has various models of it that can be applied whereas here we can see there's a total interrelationship of things and a crossover and not you know everything's kind of you know, not, not everything began at zero. So everything has like its own color and flavor and a different sort of approach and emphasis on certain aspects of that. And when that becomes kind of forced, it becomes really unnatural and heavy and then feeding into things like this sort of false consciousness model, which we've seen here as well. Um, but overall, I suppose we're just, we all are, for, for our purposes, all we really want to point out is that it's just, it is this sort of mediated and a kind of a marketed and mediated discourse around economics in particular where it's presented as something scientific uh it has all this sort of uh different sort of acronyms or different sort of terminology around it to deliberately you know kind of intended to make it obscure and make it sort of alien where it's actually quite simple and straightforward in some regards um that's all we really want to get out of so if, we, if we're taking this as you know in the broader strokes to be applying to all economies everywhere and all sorts of you know exchanges of money and transactions or developments um now we you know and it and it's as kind of as hazardous at that level when we're looking at things you know we're looking at you know um third world countries or you know emerging economies looking to develop it, it's even potentially more disastrous and more hazardous to that end you know so i just want to kind of point to that a little bit and just see where we can get where is it just this quote, all we want to see is like how any of these things kind of manifest and the shape and form that they take, you know. So this is a quote from a paper which I'll attach as well um, to the reading list. Uh, Escobar, as a piece of research, is concerned with examining how what is portrayed as a neutral knowledge about an object creates that object by establishing a set of relations between its elements. Okay, so it's quite abstract. We're trying to conjure something out of nothing. So as soon as we begin a conversation around something, a certain set of relationships form around that. And through this mechanism, a set of procedures that decides what constitutes valid statements is produced. So we can just see that all these things begin to attach and it becomes a physical thing. It, something that starts out as like a notional end of it, it begins to become very physical. This will become very clear now when we start looking at, say, banking and you know um changes over in, in in currency or you know sort of from gold standards to fiat money we get that and where you see this sort of once it's it's begun everything sort of begins to kind of attach and organize itself around that and all this is thereby displacing alternative ways of seeing the world the, and this is where it gets interesting in terms of development the political dimension is in this explanation lies foremost in the normalizing effects of development discourse okay so it's this where, where it all becomes like a an inherited set of um rules contracts obligations whatever sort of economic exchange or memos of understanding tra -la -la, whatever it would be around that sort of if it's like development loans or whatever that all this kind of has kind of been conjured from thin air essentially is what we're trying to get at here so I want to do two things now. One is, um, I'll just mark it because it's clear now that the other aspect of this when it comes to development discourse and economics in particular and in general, uh, the transaction, the language is English and the grammar that comes across is essentially English. And that's kind of interesting in and of itself where we're talking about, you know, 
English speaking countries making up a, you know, a small minority of, you know, of the world essentially, yet this is the language of capitalism and this is the language of development discourse in particular, where we're looking at third world countries or emerging economies where English is by no means the, um, the first language. That's the first thing I want to flag here. And the second one is, um, the whole geographic perception. And this is something which is again inherited and it does come from like, you know, a, a, a kind of a colonial period when things were appear different. So I'm just going to show this short video, which is based around, it's a clip from the West Wing, based around um, a really important and a, a, a geographical map called the Peters World Map. So I'm just going to show you this and we'll do this compare and contrast and then come back after that, okay? Hi, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry to be late. Not a problem. I'm CJ Craig. Of course you are. I'm Dr. John Fallow with Dr. Cynthia Sales and uh, Professor Donald Huke. Huke? Huke. Okay, and you are the Organization of Cartographers for Social Equality. Well, we're, uh, we're from the OCSE. We have many members. How many? 4,300 dues-paying members. What are the dues? Uh, $20 a year for the newsletter. Let's start. Wait. Wait, I want to see this. This is Josh Lyman. Indeed you are. Josh, this is Dr. Fallow, and Hi. this is Mary Men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should we begin? Yes. Plain and simple, uh, we'd like President Bartlett to aggressively support legislation that would make it mandatory for every public school in America to teach geography using the Peters projection map instead of the traditional Mercator. Give me 200 bucks and it's done. Really? No. Why are we changing maps? Uh, because, CJ, the Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias against the Third World. Really? The German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. But. Yes. It distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. Now look at Greenland. Okay. Now look at Africa. Okay. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is in reality 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe, drawn considerably larger than South America, when at 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico, when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait, relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing's where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. The Peters projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? Uh-huh. <laughs> so, you're probably wondering what all this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. Guys, we want to thank you very much for coming in. Hang on, we're going to finish this. Okay. What do maps have to do with social equality, you ask? She asked. Salvatore Natoli of the National Council for Social Studies argues, in our society we unconsciously equate size with importance and even power. I'm going to check in on Tommy. Go. These guys find breaking in on that map, you'll call me, right? Probably not. Okay. When third world countries are misrepresented, they're likely to be valued less. When Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization, when the top of the map is given to the northern hemisphere and the bottom is given to the southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how? Where else could you put the northern hemisphere but on the top? On the bottom. How? Like this. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. Okay, so 
you know, really interesting little clip about a, a fascinating map. And it does, you know, all I really wanted to point a point out there was this sort of, you know, underlying assumptions and things that are in the sort of grammar and notionally inherited in the inherited wisdom of of um of people when they look at this and how the world is actually laid out simple as that you know and different sort of scales and prominences in one direction or the other you know so that's all i really wanted to do about that just kind of pull the rug out from under the whole thing essentially just to show that the perception is off from the from the instant that it begins really um another thing just to kind of flag would be just doing a quick kind of critical discourse analysis on the difference between two words, multinational and transnational. You know, there's these obvious differences to what they are. Multinational companies own a home company and its subsidiaries. Um, they're centralized, they have centralized management and the multinational companies will face barriers in decision-making due to its centralized management system. So that's one reason why transnational corporations have become a bigger deal really with um, being able to gain more interest in the local markets since they maintain their own systems. So you just kind of you scalp off what you need essentially with that. And transnational companies not be having a centralized management system and don't have subsidiaries. So there's none of the attache of everything that you'd need for a multinational corporation where you're essentially lighter on your feet and can move through places really. The other thing that is, you know, even to go back before transnational um, corporations was even a concept is just this, this, the word multinational, if we want to look at that, um, multi just sounds like a, a populist thing and an abundant sort of scenario where, you know, it, again, this sort of gives it a positive spin which isn't necessarily like, um, you know, appropriate really. So again, just to flag those sorts of difference where transnational looks as it is, where it just kind of comes in at stealth, takes what it wants without any sort of footprint on on any particular place and then leaves whatever, mostly natural resources or cheaper services. Um, and I just want to kind of lead on from there with a, a video on the dark side of investment agreements issued by the Transnational Institute. So we we'll watch that and um, come back to have a, a discussion around these things. The dark side of investment agreements, the story of how international tribunals force governments to pay our money to corporations. How many times have you heard politicians or economists say, if a country wants to develop, it just needs three things, investment, investment, and investment. And who can disagree? We all know how important it is to invest in education or health. But what does it mean when we are talking about big corporations investing in developing countries? Surely that must be good too. Well, that's the theory. Since 1990, flows of foreign investments into developing countries has grown more than 15 times, reaching 570 billion US dollars in 2010. That's a lot of money, but very little of it reaches the poor. Most flow straight back to the industrialized nations. But that's a story for another day. Today, we will explore the secretive agreements that governments sign, hoping to attract all that money and what they are giving away instead. Don't you think it is time we take a look at the small print in these agreements? It doesn't take much reading to realize that behind the gloss, investment treaties have a very dark side. Investment agreements allow corporations to sue governments at secretive international tribunals when governments try to regulate in favor of their own people. Yet, governments cannot sue corporations even if they commit human rights abuses or environmental damage. So, governments are stuck with all the obligations, and corporations get all the rights and protection. Hard to believe? In 2010, Uruguay decided to protect public health by including large health warnings on cigarette packages. It was immediately sued by tobacco giant Philip Morris, who argued the measures were unreasonable. And in 2001, when Argentina, in the midst of a major financial crisis, took measures to protect its population by freezing electricity and water rates, it was hit by over 40 lawsuits by big corporations. 
Argentina had to pay out 912 million US dollars. That's equivalent to the annual average salary of 140,000 teachers or the building of 40 new hospitals. By 2010, there were at least 331 cases filed by transnational companies against states. The current crisis has shown that our economic system has enriched the 1% at the expense of the 99%. The massive gap in wealth has not just been caused by bank bailouts or unjust taxation. International investment law played its part. Investment agreements keep benefiting the 1%. European and North American corporations who filed 91% of the lawsuits, the investment lawyers who charge around 800 US dollars an hour. It's time to put corporations and investment agreements back under public control. Join Transnational Institute's call for an alternative investment model. Okay, so again, just wanted to kind of comment on the, you know, this being used as a, you know, the amount of human rights travesties to come about, even just with those sort of very simple examples that we have there. We have, we'll have more um, in the next couple of slides, but um, what what really amounts here to this sort of depoliticization um, of the de of development, in, essentially, you know, and the sort of the core, the key aspects of that, and um, being assumed by, you know. Um, a broader more global political perspective on processes that produce poverty um in the first place so it's kind of you know it's presented as this local technical fussy sort of perspective of you know do we want to put health warnings on cigarettes rather than this being you know some sort of broader um you know horrendous miscarry of justices and you know um human rights abuses essentially all kind of made appear valid and um you know above board because a contract or a loan agreement was signed or there's a certain number of sort of agreements put in place that are just being followed and carried out essentially you know so it's this separating of intentions and outcomes um that shows this really that we can just see what you know who who is getting what from what particular deal and how it appears to be so really um and that's something which is kind of going to go on and on here where we see how it's kind of worked into a really you know poor state of affairs on many different fronts with this sort of rapacious um willful sort of abuse of 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 laws and agreements and human rights uh, across the across the board with that with this sort of uh, approach to 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 development or in this you know delivering loans to in, in investments to to emerging economies or third world countries really um just back, it kind of came up in the the the, the quick, or sorry, in the video there about the economics made easy. But um, this is a really you know it's a pertinent adage with it when all you have is the hammer, the whole world looks like a nail, and it's this sort of mono approach to, you know, capital essentially being the only thing that can deliver these things and these changes, um, you know, and this sort of productivity or you know development per se being the only thing where once you kind of all if the only thing you have to offer is loading more and more of that on um you can see how disastrous this becomes so we're just going to get at that right now because the next you know this is the vital thing it was a case of like do you, it's the only show in town really you know where it's a case of just a market-based problem to a market-based solution or markedly solution sorry to a market-based problem is the you know the 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 approach where finance, capital, loans, investments, all leading towards development, being the only way to really run with that. This next video, we're just gonna show how this sort of inflated and just sort of really bizarre abstract monetary system has come about um, and through the fiat money system.
as a civilization, we've obviously we've obviously had a had a great run. Uh, we've done very well. We had the industrial revolution. Uh, we survived that. Uh, we've built a lot of modern uh, military technology. We've survived that uh, so far. We built a banking system, um, <laughs> and, and we're still struggling with that part of it. But but you know we've had a good run. It's kind of like when I was working at Loft Street for seven years. I had the experience uh, some people would have. Let's say working at a meat processing plant, they become vegetarian. You, know, you work on Wall Street and you see how these banks like Bowman, J.P. Morgan, these other banks make money. When you, when you see money, it kind of makes you sick. Well, I think if the people knew what the banking system is up to, uh, as Henry Ford said, there would be a revolution tomorrow morning. Uh, the fact is most people think that what a bank does is lend you money that someone else has put in the bank previously. Um, but what a bank actually does, what a commercial bank does, uh, is to create money from nothing and then lend it to you at interest. If I do that, if I manufacture money in my own home, it's called counterfeiting. Uh, if an accountant creates money out of nothing in the company accounts, it's called cooking the books. But if a bank does it, it's perfectly legal. Uh, and so long as you allow fraud to be legalized, uh, then all kinds of problems are going to pop up in the economic system which you can't do anything about. Private banks create money out of nothing and lend it at interest. Now, that sounds absurd. Uh, when I teach sophomores, you know, about money and banking and how banks, they never believe it. And so you have to go through it again and again. Yes, banks really do create money. They really do. Here's how it happens. And it's absurd. And they're right to, to uh, doubt that that could possibly be what's really going on, but it is. Now, if the banking lobby is very strong, they're going to say, well, we don't want to change the system. We're making so much money out of it. What we have to do is, A, try and convince the people that it's their fault, um, that their wage claims are too high, and that's why we're having lots of inflation, or people are speculating on housing, and that's why house prices are going up. What they're not going to say is that this is happening because banks are creating money out of nothing and pumping it into the system, and that's why prices are going up. But how is it that we've ended up with a system in which banks have the power to create money? Since 1971, when President Nixon took the United States off what was left of the gold standard, the world has operated under a system of money known as fiat. The dollar, the pound, the euro are all government fiat currencies. Fiat is a Latin word meaning let it be so. It is the law that this government currency be money. Indeed, without that legal enforcement and the fact that we must pay taxes with this money, that dollar bill or that computer digit that represents a dollar would be pretty much meaningless. Only the government has the power to issue fiat money, but banks can create it through lending. Over the last 40 years, since this system of fiat money became the global norm, the supply of money has grown exponentially. In fact, we've seen the greatest growth in the supply of money in history. But who benefits? Of course, those that have the power to issue money, governments and banks. Then, those companies and individuals that get this money early. They can spend it before the prices of the things they want to buy have risen to reflect the new money in circulation. In other words, they get services, products or assets cheap. But prices soon rise, so holders of assets such as houses or shares will then see gains without there necessarily being any improvements to the company or house in question. Often this can lead to speculative bubbles. But what about those at the bottom of the pyramid? Those on fixed wages or incomes? Those who live in remote areas? Or those with savings? By the time this newly created money has filtered down to them, the prices of the things they want to buy have increased. Their savings buy them less, however, and their wages remain largely unchanged. In some cases, they have to take on debt just to be able to afford the things they were previously able to buy. Which means they have to go back to the banks. In reality, this process of creating money only redistributes wealth from the bottom to the top of the pyramid. And thus that ever-increasing gulf between rich and poor gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, when, when you get off the gold standard and you go into a fiat money currency, combined with a fractional reserve banking system, 
you end up compounding debt faster than you can ever possibly produce to support that debt. So eventually you're going to find yourself back into debt slavery. And that's what's happened in the U.S. For every dollar of GDP, for example, in the U.S., it now it also creates something like $5.50 worth of debt. Because it, this, is, this, is, this is what happens when our economy flips over and basically capsizes. And, of course, the government solution now to, uh, to, to address all the problems is basically to create more debt. You can never get enough of a currency that doesn't work. You can print it till kingdom comes, but you can't print wealth and you can't get yourself out of debt by making more debt. If you could print wealth, Zimbabwe would be the largest, most prosperous country on the planet. We all know it doesn't work. Of the money in the world today, 97% of it is debt. The French philosopher Voltaire once said, all paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value, zero. Okay, so yet again, we can just see it as like any number of kind of abstracts here um, with something being agreed and standardized, but, you know, with that sort of extra caveat of it being, um, you know, reproducible or, you know, for, for it to be kind of manufactured and, you know, reproduced essentially, and that having a disastrous knock on in terms of how, um, how we can measure a flow of money or have that next to a, a value or a a, a, a kind of a, a solid standard which would have been the gold standard previously um you know and that's all i really want to get at is this is this kind of concept of just then becoming too big to fail where you know we're in this sort of disastrous situation when it comes to 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 to, to, the, to the amount of debt that's been attached to every single dollar coming out of somewhere like america so you can imagine what it's like then when we look across the world to so like the developing world um just i want to move kind of quickly through this i'm not going to go into it but I just wanted to flag this concept of sovereignty really and this that concept the justified national development the principle of state sovereignty has come into question in this global age now you know so it, it, this sort of um neoclassical theory of a borderless world and the disastrous effects where well, we're talking about this type of monetary system and loaning and this sort of you know nebulous manufactured sort of approach to it basically being rolled out and kind of you know given from this top down trickle down sort of effect in in, in developing or emerging economies and that's all i really wanted to flag there where it was a case of this sort of you know how how the, the the kind of the paradox here of how you know it was made appear appear mostly from the IMF and the World Bank or them being kind of extensions of a U.S. sort of um you know Fed Reserve really um and how that has kind of extended that far and now there's sort of kick back to it that that can and should happen just in terms of you know people become countries nation states being reluctant to take up these sorts of IMF loans or different sort of loans from the World Bank, knowing that they come with this sort of, that they're impossible to pay back. And it just comes with any sort of amount of erosion of civic freedom, civic rights, and just sort of uh, privatizing of every single aspect of that of that particular country, including its resources, which we'll get at as well. Um, so the other side of that top down is just like in terms of, you know, again, just to flag a bottom up development where it's come from, you know, somewhere, um, you know, more of a sustainable development model now, I suppose, is what we'd be looking at with that. But the, the bottom line here, I'll just read this quote out and we'll talk about it. Then. To speak of bottom-up development is to confuse the means and the goals of development. If the goal of development is defined as enlarging people's choice, this presupposes a desire and capacity to choose as well as knowledge of possible choices. These factors, they argue, are often put as a precondition for development as well as the goal for development. The missing link in these explanations is trusteeship. Someone who has the necessary vantage point guides, guides and controls the de development process. This is why Nutz remains skeptical of attempts to reform and develop the development apparatus to achieve a true, true development from the bottom. Proposals for reform tend to look more like recap capitulations of old efforts than true attempts to reform so you know this is the, the, the this I'll just kind of flag that assumption again that everything is starting from the same sort of 
place of understanding and just even to go back and flag it further that the language that this happens in is English language. So just instantly we're at sort of losses or it's not sort of even or equated in any sort of regard like that. And this kind of has another sort of a, a impact as a result really in that obvious sense. And barring that, it's a case of just, you know, we're looking at the, um, you know, the, the desire and capacity and these sorts of cho choices. And there's a certain sort of set of values that come with that really, which, uh, you know, are having to be, are being foisted upon, you know, indigenous or very sort of rich and diverse sort of cultures and communities and countries, rather than that just being something which was desired or kind of inherited in the first place. So we see really horrendous examples of that. I didn't get to kind of talk about this, but we look at like, you know, um, powdered milk or milk formula being used in Africa as this being this sort of like fashionable choice of what is done in the in the West rather than breastfeeding, and the you know immune systems of children being knocked directly by not having that sort of the mother's breast milk. You know, so we can take some sort of core idea of that, and this being something being presented as something desirable essentially, and having a, a perilous sort of impact. Um, I want to move on quickly two more things i want to cover really quick and one is this sort of you know just to take this you know um this this version of you know um capitalism to its logical end and this disaster capitalism where essentially there's a market market solution to a market problem and no matter how far that goes and how rapacious it is so you can see that you know a post disaster in this in this instance the um you know Puerto Rico more recently and Haiti um, being like firm examples of where this has come with a, an economy straight after where, you know, the, the, the loans are given with um, very serious stipulations. And there's a certain sort of crudeness and a harshness to this where you can just see how much people have to give up in terms of just trying to recover from a, um, from a natural disaster. So this kind of shown this model of capitalism at its at its worst and its most sort of um, monstrous, really, where it can kind of it can see an opportunity in absolutely everything, including like other people's kind of misery directly after a disaster. Um, and this is, you know, there's a whole school of um, of economics that comes from. I'm going to show another short video called Shock Doctrine, which does explain this a little bit and the kind of the Milton Friedman School of Economics, really. The 1940s have been a decade of breakthroughs and developments in medicine and psychiatry. Scientists have developed a new technology to cure mentally ill adults. With the use of electro shocks, the minds of sick patients are being wiped clean, giving them a fresh start. On this blank slate, physicians then imprint a new, healthy personality. Remaking people, shocking them into obedience. This is a story about that powerful idea. In the 1950s, it caught the attention of the CIA. The agency funded a series of experiments. Out of them was produced a secret handbook on how to break down prisoners. The key was using shock to reduce adults to a childlike state. It's a fundamental hypothesis of this handbook that these techniques are, in essence, methods of inducing regression of the personality. There is an interval, which may be extremely brief, of suspended animation, a kind of psychological shock or paralysis. Experienced interrogators recognize this effect when it appears, and know that at this moment the source is far more open to suggestion, far likelier to comply than he was just before he experienced the shock. But these techniques don't only work on individuals. They can work on whole societies. A collective trauma, a war, a coup, a natural disaster, a terrorist attack puts us all into a state of shock. And in the aftermath, like the prisoner in the interrogation chamber, we too become childlike. 
or inclined to follow leaders who claim to protect us. One person who understood this phenomenon early on was the most famous economist of our era, Milton Friedman. Friedman believed in a radical vision of society in which profit and the market drive every aspect of life, from schools to healthcare, even the army. He called for abolishing all trade protections, deregulating all prices, and eviscerating government services. These ideas have always been tremendously unpopular, and understandably so. They cause waves of unemployment, send prices soaring, and make life more precarious for millions. Unable to advance their agenda democratically, Friedman and his disciples were drawn to the power of shock. The subject should be rudely awakened and immediately blindfolded and handcuffed. When arrested at this time, most subjects experience intense feelings of shock, insecurity, and psychological stress. The idea is to prevent the subject from relaxing and recovering from shock. understood that just as prisoners are softened up for interrogation by the shock of their capture, massive disasters could serve to soften us up for his radical free market crusade. He advised politicians that immediately after a crisis, they should push through all the painful policies at once before people could regain their footing. He called this method economic shock treatment. I call it the shock doctrine. Take a second look at the iconic events of our era, and behind many, you will find its logic at work. This is the secret history of the free market. It wasn't born in freedom and democracy. It was born in shock. Isolation, both physical and psychological, must be maintained from the moment of apprehension. The capacity for resistance is diminished by disorientation. Prisoners should maintain silence at all times. They should never be allowed to speak to each other. There's one other thing I've learned from my study of states of shock. Shock wears off. It is by definition a temporary state. And the best way to stay oriented, to resist shock, is to know what is happening to you and why. Okay, so yeah, again, just to kind of you look at this logical end of it and this sort of neoclassical economic theory taken to like a really horrendous end um, and being applied in, in the most inappropriate ways to, you know, the most vulnerable people. And again, this sort of the implied logic being a market solution to a market problem is says if we're going to look at that. And that's what I want to talk about now in terms of, you know, the next sort of iteration of that being into, you know, climate change or you know weather related loss um of you know just the, the the impact of that mostly on like insurance companies and the amount of financial loss so even on its own terms this system is failing um because it's it's impossible to kind of 
to keep up with these natural weather events um, and financially pay out everyone their dues in terms of the insurance of that. So that's the other side of this really. And that's where I'm going to kind of finish out the lecture, just talking well, a positive spin after this diabolical sort of notion. But anyway, yeah, so even today on our speech is 28th of February, 2018. Um, and Dublin, Ireland, where I'm doing this lecture from is was covered in like 10 centimeters of snow last night. And the whole of Europe has like a, a colder temperature than the Arctic today. Surprising this being like a really unique weather event today. And this is something where, you know, clearly is the beginning or the continuation of seismic changes in relation to the environment. And likewise, it's a case of this sort of freedom based economics of finding some sort of market in that and some sort of way of monetizing that or responding to it with a market being the only approach that seems to be able to happen. And we had the, you know, the most horrendous example of it, I suppose, was the, um, the Enron weather deriv derivatives approach of, you know, this sort of, you know, hedging bets on both sides to see the outcome between the producer and the consumer of, of it. And H Enron trying to be the winner about this sort of, you know, change in weather systems really. Um, and, you know, kind of given that sort of insurance or hedging against sort of rising prices or changes where come about from different sort of weather patterns. Um, and this is, you know, this is something which is kind of on the cars as well and kind of ongoing. And another video I just want to show about the, where, what, what have happened in Bolivia in relation to that and the monetary fund coming in and the privatization of, of every system, including the water systems there. The prospect that two-thirds of the world's population will have no access to fresh drinking water by 2025 has provoked the initial confrontations in a worldwide battle for control over the planet's most basic resource. When Bolivia sought to refinance the public water service of its third largest city, the World Bank required that it be privatized, which is how the Bechtel Corporation of San Francisco gained control over all of Cochabamba's water. Even that, which fell from the sky. Esta ley, este contrato, prohibían a la gente acumular el agua de la lluvia. Por lo tanto, el agua de la lluvia también se privatizaba. La factura de agua le daba un valor legal a la empresa para que pueda apropiarse de su, de su propiedad, de su vivienda, rematando la misma. La gente debía eh, optar por una decisión de comer menos, pagar del agua, pagar por los servicios básicos, dejar de mandar a los niños a la escuela, eh, no asistir a los hospitales y curarse en la propia casa, o en todo caso, eh, gente jubilada, por ejemplo, que tiene una renta muy, muy baja, debería eh, buscar trabajo en las calles. <risa> La consigna de el agua es nuestra, carajo. La gente sale a las calles, sale a los caminos y eh, protesta. ¿no? The price this beleaguered country paid for World Bank loans was the privatization of the state oil industry and its airline, railroad, electric, and phone companies. But the government failed to convince Bolivians that water is a commodity like any other. Entonces, eh, ahí sí eh, vimos eh, que el gobierno defendía los intereses de la transnacional Vectel porque la gente quería agua, no gases. La gente quería justicia y no balas. Bolivia was determined to defend the corporation's right to charge families living on two dollars a day, as much as one quarter of their income for water. The greater the popular resistance to the water privatization scheme, the more violent became the standoff. Y por eso vieron centenares de heridos jóvenes que a sus 16, 17 años perdieron brazos, perdieron piernas, quedaron paralíticos, quedaron lesionados de la cabeza de por vida y murió um, Víctor Hugo Daza.
Transnational corporations have a long and dark history of condoning tyrannical governments. Is it narcissism that compels them to seek their reflection in the regimented structures of fascist regimes? Hi there. This is Mark Akbar. I produced and co-directed the corporation. Okay, so, you know, that's just another snapshot there again of like a really, um, the commodification of everything where, you know, criminalizing and um, collecting rainwater being just kind of a, a most horrendous end to that. And I suppose we can just see how that kind of spills out into the real world again from this sort of the abstracts and the bespoke, the bespoke sort of specifics of one country in particular, Bolivia and this city in particular, um, then defining what happens next and, you know, essentially being involved in this sort of transaction where they're given the noose to kind of hang themselves, I suppose, and just how rapacious and how far along that can actually go and how far like a lot of these transnational corporations are willing to go um, and happy to go and, you know, be enabled by tyrannical governments or supported from, from, from their home country to show that that's like, you know, acceptable overseas economic transactions practice or development, if you want to call it that, just to show some of the most horrendous examples of it. From the bottom up then, just to kind of, you know, I want to talk about this sort of, it's not everything, but it's a thing of just, you know, in a dematerialized society, really, we want to talk about how technology's kind of taken a hand. Um, in the middle pane here, we have the experiments in child learning by Sugata Mitra, and it's all about self-learning, where he just put in these sorts of um, hole-in-the-wall computers and allows clusters of children to kind of self-learn without any adult interference or interruptions in that, and just is, you know, studying how sort of successful it is, and the results are quite astounding. Um, they, you know, there's different sort of very var levels of this being sort of published in paper form. Uh, publishes like research papers and you know it's still some of it's a slightly debated as to how like you know close this could, resembles deep learning that can happen but his 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 kind of findings on a young people young people's cluster learning and the their ability to kind of retain that knowledge is is quite astonishing we had the slide on the right there with the smartphones with Masai warriors it's kind of a bit of a trope almost now just showing how far the um how ubiquitous the technology is but again just to kind of point out that we have this capacity of you know some of the most remote indigenous communities in the world having access to the same amount of computing power as president clinton did during his time as the president of america for example um and that being a potential and not being anything until we figure out how to kind of put this together which we clearly are doing a bad job at, at the moment but there are some examples and again, on the other side, we have the Grameen Bank and Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Prize for setting up this sort of micro financing, micro lending to, um, you know, matriarchal societies, basically giving it to women in communities, all these micro loans in which to kind of grow an indigenous sort of industry. And just this sort of bespoke end of it, which is, you know, sustainable development in the here and now. Again, there's some debates about, you know, how harsh or how sort of flexible that set of transactions is and you know when you're dealing with the poorest people in the world what merits a transaction or how flexible that can and should be being you know the only the, the, the real issues around that but at the same time we have these sorts of um, models to kind of reference of of different sort of uses or different ways of thinking about these sciences or pseudosciences or technologies to kind of better you know people in the the most obscure and remote and poorest parts of the world and um, to that end, one more video where, sorry, sorry to just the One Laptop Per Child um, project, which was run out of MIT originally. And the, the, the notion of this originally was, you know, if we can't reach, if you can't build infrastructure in countries, um, you know, where it's roads to rural areas or, you know, even providing whatever sustenance need, is needed to, to educate children in particular, um, it's just as easy to throw up a Wi-Fi grid and give a, a laptop or a computer to 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 the poorest children in the world, and that's what this project is uh, is all about. So I'm just going to run this video really quick. <laughs> Yeah. 
if children have a wider access and more points of view, then there's going to be, by definition, more understanding. So I think you can eliminate poverty by education, and the laptops will be an important ingredient of that. ourselves is could we make something that was first and foremost child-centric, very low cost, and then have other features that were important to very remote children, poor parts of the world, like not use power. You didn't have to plug it in the wall that you could hand crank it or have a solar panel. A hundred dollar laptop. It is an impressive technical achievement, able to do almost everything the larger, more expensive computers can. It holds the promise of major advances in economic and social development. It's not just $100, it's going to go lower. We promise governments that it will float lower and lower and lower. My mission is the global side of it, to get the countries to do this either with foreign assistance or directly with the, with their own budget and you know there's a lot there's a lot to go there's 1.2 billion children in this world and 500 million of them really fall into the category that that is of concern to us okay so you know that's just a little snapshot of that project again i'll post about the um a link to that there as well so you know there's this sort of there's a lot of interesting projects going on and acts of philanthropy even to, to send it that far and you know um you know where the, the monetary aspect of it and that sort of you know the concept of development isn't central to it as well and they're really the vital ones now because the other side has just kind of proved to be quite disastrous in terms of where we've arrived at now um that's it I ran over again. I promise and assure you that this is the last of the long lectures. Um, next one will be on social media use and young people. Any questions or queries about that, please drop me an email and I'll come back to you with that. Okay, thanks. Bye.